Welcome to another episode of the New York Information Security Meetup. And I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Rebholz, who is the Chief Information Security Officer for Corvus Insurance. Thanks very much, Jason, for joining me. Much appreciated. How are you? Good, good. It's, uh, it's great to talk to you today, David. Thank you very much. I know you're busy, and it's uh, just before the long weekend, so we are... Um, we're going to cover a bunch of topics. We're going to have a conversation. I'd love to learn more a bit about you, how uh, how you progress to to become an executive in the cybersecurity space. So why don't we get started with that? Uh, were you always technical? Were you always uh, into into the zeros and ones? Uh, I was. Uh, you really started back when I was in high school where I started learning programming, and that's really where I got my introduction to security, and I uh, never looked back since. And uh, do you remember like the kind of the first roles that you've taken that were, you know, right out of college, uh, you know, were, you, were they hands-on technical or were they kind of like, uh, you know, different, different that, that sense? Yeah. So when I first started off my career, I, I, I actually had the luxury of going to uh, RIT where they were one of the first schools in the country that had a focus on cybersecurity. So I always knew that I wanted to be hands-on technical uh, straight out of college. And so when I left college, I started looking at uh, pen testing companies uh, and just doing that proactive service. And just by coincidence, I, I found Mandiant and was one of the very first college hires they had. So when I showed up my first day, uh, I was thinking I was going to start doing pen testing. And they handed me a hard drive and an end case dongle said, here you go. Tell us everything that happened. So I started learning forensics. And so I dove into that area very, very quickly and, and thankfully just fell in love with it. So, so many things that I have to double click on. First of all, um, Jason, it's, it's such a cool story. Why did you look for like pen testing companies? I mean, back in the day, I mean, now pen testing, everybody knows about it. Everybody is familiar with the term. And But back then, you know, it wasn't as common. What made you, you know, pick, you know, this particular role? So I, I have always been interested in puzzles. I, I was the nerd in high school that was speed uh, solving Rubik's cubes. And so when you combine the puzzle aspect with the technology aspects of computers, it just naturally kind of led into pen testing. And so for me, I was very fortunate throughout my entire career, just timing was always there. Uh, and so when I started getting interested in computers and security in particular, it was around the time when the first capture the flag type things were, were emerging, right? And when I say like these CTFs, it was back when it was like, look at the HTML source and find the password, right? It was just like the basic of basic things. And so for me, that was the first interaction with what pen testing was. And, and you couple it with just gaming, right? You know, learning how can I try to bypass some of the controls on, on these games you know, that really kind of geared me towards that interest in, in pen testing, just like trying to break things in a, in a safe environment, basically. You know, uh, Ruby Cube, I mean, it's a lost art. You know, every, you know, the younger generation is like, uh, it's, they're so enamored with the Xbox. They don't actually do anything physical unless, unless it's on the Xbox itself. And, you know, it's funny because I've asked this before, you know, you know, people um, tend to think that there's a, a lot of planning involved in becoming uh, an executive, but a lot of time is lack in circumstance. And you were, as you mentioned, you're very humble by saying that you got lucky that you picked, end up at a great emerging company. Mandiant was, was a great place to be, especially at the early stage. And as you mentioned, you had that hands-on uh, you thought you were getting into this like you know cool role, and then basically they gave you just this the foundation of of forensics, right? Exactly. So, did you know what to do with that hard drive when you got it, or was it like uh, you had to self learn? Oh, I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, it, if anything, <laughs> it was a mistake on, on Mandy's part to, to give me that much trust. But uh, it, you know, it was something that paid off. You know, I, again, it, very fortunate where that was a time when the best of the best were, were sitting at Mandy. And so I was, I was sitting right next to some of the greatest minds in the industry. And, you know, when, when you're coming out of college, your goal is to be a sponge and just learn as much as you possibly can. So, you know, I just dove straight into it and uh, asked a lot of stupid questions to, to figure it out. And, you know, it was very much a, a brute force method where it's just like, okay, let me, let me just look through every file on this system and see what stands out. And, and uh, honestly, the, one of the, greatest things that I had was that Rubik's cube because I was really good at identifying patterns. And so when you're looking through these systems doing forensics, 
a lot of that is just identifying the things that stand out, right? And so I could look through a mass amount of data and identify the things that just were just were sitting out of the, the usual just a little bit. Uh, and so I was kind of a natural for forensics because I had just inadvertently, you know, was doing this pattern recognition uh, with, with those Rubik's cubes. Yeah, and it's amazing that you can apply that. So it was just like a moment from uh, Incredible Mind with Russell Crowe, where you like <laughs> you see all those numbers and you're able to. There's to there's figure, definitely a lot of situations figure. where that that visual pops up, and you know you you know when you're looking through that amount of data and you just find that that one little piece. Yeah, like there there were times where I jump up in the middle of a room by myself and just fist pump in the air, just like that's the missing piece. I found it. Yeah, maybe there's uh, there's something to be said about, uh, you know, learning, well, having kids learn how to, you know, p recognize patterns. And I think the Ruby Cube is a, is a great place to be. Uh, you know, puzzles of any kinds, I think, are, uh, again, it's some, a bit of a lost art. Lego as well. There's all kinds yeah. of things that you can do. Um, now, so you advanced at Mandiant, right? So do you remember, like, what was, like, kind of the first couple roles you've done? How do you advance from, you know, being kind of the, uh, you know, the forensic grunt to, you know, basically, cause that's what you were when you just joined yep. to take ownership over like more, more kind of difficult roles. Yeah. So it was a very natural progression. You, know, I would say for the first two years, I was just heads down in the data, really focused on, on everything. You know, it's just, you know, file to file kind of grinding from system to system, doing the analysis and, you know, over time, when I, I was able to just build out my, my own internal processes, you know, I was able to start ripping through systems very, very quickly. And so that naturally led to me taking more of a, a technical leadership role on individual engagements, where, you know, I would focus in on helping the more junior uh, analysts review their systems, double checking work. And then that progressed into leading engagements. And so for me, this was really the first step into uh what what an executive role would look like, right? And it doesn't seem like it's a one to one, but really, when you're doing incident response and you're managing clients, right? You're you're bridging that gap between the technical world and the business world, and at the same time, you're setting a vision for where are you going in this investigation? How do you prioritize the efforts, right? So there are so many parallels to what it is to be an exec uh, when you're doing this incident response role, and so. As I progressed and I took ownership over more and more engagements, you know, I found myself going into a manager role where I'm leading people. So it was a very just natural progression uh, where you, know, you, you just level up from the, the forensics grunt looking at systems to leading the technical teams to leading the engagements where you're managing the clients and then leading you know, teams of people as well. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, how did you make sure you don't lose, you know, those the skill set against because things are moving so quickly. And now as a manager, you're less hands on, you're more kind of, again, customer facing as well as the internal team facing. So you're busy doing that. So maybe that's the first question. Second question, love to hear if you have any kind of cool stories that that you came across because that's what people remember from conversations. So and I know you probably have tons because again, uh, doing forensics and and incident response, it's pretty boring most of the times. And then there's spikes of excitement. So maybe there's some you can tell us about some of those excitement there. So two two questions. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first question around kind of maintaining that, that technical edge, I was always able to just keep my foot into the storyline of an attack, right? And part of that is when you're understanding where these attacks are going, you're naturally asking the more technical questions. Hey, how did you find this? How are you positive that this is the right finding? Uh, and just being in different groups and just being in the middle of these conversations, you, you're you not in the weeds in the sense of, you know, you're, you're going to be ripping apart the ones and zeros, but you have enough of the foundation built where you can connect the dots and be able to say, okay, I understand that this is a new attack technique coming out, or this is a new piece of malware. And it's about asking the right questions and being able to go deeper with the other subject matter experts to get that understanding, right? And you know, this is something that I learned really early on in my career. I, I had an interest in reverse engineering. And when I started digging into it and teaching myself that, I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I was like, there are people that are 10 times better than I will ever be at this. I was like, I'm going to let them be the experts, but I'm going to have conversations with them and learn the tips of uh, the tips and the kind of the tools of the trade so I can just be better prepared for. And so I've always found by just asking intelligent questions and going down rabbit holes 
you're able to maintain that edge while still maintaining the ability to run an investigation. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really amazing. an important skill that I think is often overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing that, again, it, if to, to unravel some of that stuff, um, you know, the fact you recognize you're never going to be like a world expert, but you have a certain skill set that are complementary that you can combine them and then have, a, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the, the overall, you know, so basically it, it, that's what you did. So you figured, okay, I'm not going to be like, you know, a world renowned expert in forensics, but I can do really well because I now have these other skill set. And and you did that early on, which is really, uh, you know, insightful. Um, and, and I think, again, they don't teach you that in business school. <laughs> Uh, they don't teach you that definitely in any kind of technical, you know, discipline. It's, just, it's more of a kind of a very soft type of, of, of skill set to be able to recognize. Um, so coming back to the second uh, question, any any cool, you know, stories you can share? Because, again, Mandiant was doing some very, um, very cool uh, projects, right, as a company. Yeah, it, you know, there's something to be said for Mandy and, you know, being one of the leaders in the space. And certainly back then, uh, there was no one that was even remotely close in, in my biased opinion. So, you know, Mandy and being Mandy, and I certainly did my fair share of nation state threats. Uh, to be honest, I, I found them to be less interesting because they were more cookie cutter, mm -hmm. right? There's a, a specific playbook that these actors are using. Uh, and once you understand the playbook, it's a lot like playing Mad Libs. It's just, you know, change out a couple nouns and adverbs and you've got a you've got a new investigation. Uh, so I was fortunate where I always gravitated more towards financial crime. So this was around the height of a lot of the credit card breaches that were happening. And so um, I tended to go and just gravitate towards those things. So one of my favorite engagements that I worked on involved a, a company that um, essentially managed the balances for debit cards. Uh, and this was a situation where the threat actors got into the environment. They you know, did their typical thing of mapping it all out, understanding where everything lives, and you know, basically knew the environment better than most of the IT admins there. Uh, and so uh, what ended up happening was they were able to gain access to this database, and they were able to grab information for a handful of, of debit cards. And they just started increasing the balances on this. And then at the same time, they had a network of money mules around the world that were drawing down with these stolen debit cards. And so you would see them go in, they just monitor the balance of these accounts. And when it got down to uh, you know a certain amount, they would bump it back up, add a couple million dollars to it, and just you know do this for you know 24 hours. Uh, and they they stole a crazy amount of money. Uh, and you know th that was something where. You know, we got in there, we did the investigation, you work on kicking them out of the environment. And I'll never forget this. I got a call from our VP uh, after I'd been on site uh, for what felt like months, uh, came home. And that weekend, VP calls me up and says, hey, they're back. Uh, and so we, we went back and started all again. And no way. this was a situation <laughs> where uh, and this is like this is like the testament to asset management. Uh, the attackers got back into the environment because there was an abandoned office building with a desktop that had stayed powered on underneath somebody's desk. Nobody knew about it because the office building was abandoned, but this, it still had power. It was still hooked up to the internet and the attacker had just randomly placed a back door on there. There's no way they would have known this, right? But just randomly placed a back door on there. And because it was outside all of the, the visibility of, uh, of certainly um, our team, but also of the uh, client's team, uh, the attacker was able to just walk back in and just restart their attack. So uh, to this day, it stands as one of my favorite investigations that I ever supported. And it's amazing. And, you know, that that story really uh, reflects, like, you know, how large the attack surface is for most of these organizations that they have no idea. And then also what's happening, I think that uh, recently you know, we've seen, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to really forklift the entire infrastructure because you just don't know this. It can be something at the firmware level that um, you just have no control over and uh, and, and that you, you take the risk if to basically still maintain some presence of the adversaries despite the fact that you kind of clean the, you know, clean the systems, right? Yeah, I mean, to some degree, it's an impossible task for these teams to, to do, right? Kick the attacker out and make sure everything is clean. Uh, you know, that being said, I, I think at the same time, we tend to overcomplicate the issue as, as well, right? You know, certainly when you're dealing with nation state threats, uh, it is it, it is a challenge to try to keep up with them and, and kick them out of the environment, right? And even when you do that successfully, which is more than possible, 
uh, you still have to keep your guard up because you, you know they're going to try to get back in. And so uh, although it's complex, there it, there is a simple path that should be taken because otherwise what ends up happening, I see this all too often on uh, on engagements now, where teams, these IR teams will overcomplicate how they got to contain the incident and how they have to recover and how they have to do the investigation. And so what you end up having is just a lot of excess waste of time, of resources, of, of worry, where, you know, there's this certain fear, you know, FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt that gets spun into it. And you have to try to remove that and think logically about this, because at the end of the day, you are dealing with a human actor. You, te- you typically will know their playbook. So if you follow a prescribed uh, kind of pattern there to, to get them out of the environment and remediate the situation and provide yourself enough air cover where your tools are going to overlap so you can build that confidence, you'll never be 100%, but you can get up to 95% confidence fairly easily to try to get that and then just, you know, stay on it. Then it's a lot of blocking and tackling to stay on the issue. You know, it's so interesting that you mentioned the the, the nation states are, are, you know, they were kind of boring in the sense that they were using the same methodologies. You'd think that they'd be more creative, you know. Why, why do you think that is? Like, why, why do you think they're, like, so rigid in terms of what they follow well so i think there there's there's two components of this you know the first is where they're really interesting is in their malware because you you can see the amount of effort that they're spending to build malware that's not going to be detected uh, and is going to provide them the functionality Uh, and additionally depending on the environment you'll see them pull out some pretty creative methods to get around and, and kind of move around but at the end of the day this is a an operation that's happening at scale Right. And so you're going to have people that are clocking in and clocking out. And so they just need the playbook. And, you know, at the end of the day, they don't need to be fancy to accomplish their mission in most cases. Right. There's certainly edge cases like your your solar winds type situation where that's going to be a very, very sophisticated attack and is really impressive how they did that. But that's the one percent of the attacks that happen, even at the nation state levels. Right. Um, So, yeah, it's you have the playbook. It works. You don't need to go out with your most sophisticated tools or techniques because the second that that happens, that's then a known attack. And now others are going to adapt to it and start detecting it. So you, you want to go out and just go with the thing that's going to work consistently. And when it's detected, just go up that ladder. But you're not going to start at the top wrong. And Jason, can we extrapolate from that that the opposite is true, that defenders can potentially eliminate a lot of the risk by doing, you know, the mundane stuff? Again, it's not the that 1%. I mean, yeah, it's always very difficult to protect against that 1%, that creative 1%. But a lot of it is is come down to the basics, right? A hundred percent. And that's my core philosophy with security is you have to focus on the fundamentals, the basics. They're not sexy. uh, They're oftentimes not fun, but they're effective, right? And so you can put together a fairly effective security strategy and approach on a shoestring budget, uh, and it'll get you fairly far. Uh, it's you know, this. I see this all too often where people invest in tools and technologies thinking that it's going to be the silver bullet. But at the end of the day, they don't set it up properly. They don't end up monitoring it. So you, you bought this the Ferrari, but you're driving it in New York City. It's just you, you really can't use it. And, you know, what's the point? Right. Focus on the basics. Get a bicycle. Travel throughout New York City. You'll get to where you need to go on a fraction of the price just as effectively and if not faster if you you know buy the fancy car i think some some folks buy ferraris and have it parked they don't even use the fraction exactly. of, of it, you know it's amazing like how much money is spent on technology and yeah. they only use a fraction i've heard fraction stories of before of people spending millions of dollars on technology and they didn't plan ahead on how they can implement it and when you have you know larger environments where you need multiple teams you got to get on their their roadmap and so you know plenty of times i've walked in environments they said I was like, hey, where you know, you, you guys mentioned you have a next gen firewall. Where is it? Oh, well, it's still sitting on the dock because we couldn't get anybody to set it up. I was like, okay, well, when did you guys buy it? Oh, we bought it last year. You know, we're, we'll get around to it. So, well, yeah, it's not not the best use of your time or resources then. That's where the term shelfware comes in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so don't you miss the days of um, you know the excitement that like just getting on site and you know figure things out because it's it is exciting when things happen and you actually also see uh some of these folks um you know in the darkest hour you know if you're an it director or cio you're a, not a happy camper when you show up because it's uh, you know 
it should hit, hits the fan and something's out because you don't get call for nothing. Don't you miss those days? Uh, I mean, honestly, I can say, no, I, I don't, you know, it's, <laughs> It is. It's a very exciting thing. Uh, you know, there. I, I was the guy that would buy a one-way plane ticket, and you know, I I finished when I finished, right? And you know, there's something to be said of being in the position to really help people. And for me, that was the driving force. Is we were able to go in, figure out what's happening, and get people back into position. Uh, you know, I think over time, though, what I started recognizing was I'm trying to solve a much larger problem one client at a time. And so when I hit that realization, I said, you know what, like I've learned the things that I wanted to learn. I've helped the companies that I've wanted to help. And it was always a situation where it's just like, oh, you know, it's just, there's one more, right? And it's just like, you know, when you would want to go on vacation, say, it's like, oh, I can't go because I got to help the next company. It's like, it's always going to be there. And so what I started recognizing was that there's a much larger problem at play here. And I'm not going to be able to fix that as an incident responder. And so that's where I said, you know what, it's time to tackle a different type of problem uh, and try to hit this a little bit closer to the source problem uh, versus just, you know, supporting. There's plenty of companies that are going to support, uh, you know, the victims here and, you know, <laughs> we want to empower them. Uh, but yeah, I just reached that point where the the uh, excitement was lost and it became more of a chore than, uh, than it was anything else. And, and the burnout is real. We've seen that here. Like there's a lot of cybersecurity professionals that are quitting and moving to other, you know, different roles because of that, especially, I think, especially at the incident response uh, area. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really difficult. You know, there's, you're, you're working 80 hour weeks. You know, my, the record that I never wanted to break was 196 hours in two weeks over, that was over a, a Thanksgiving uh, break where I, no I had wow. some time to spend with the family there. So yeah, it's, it's something where you're always on, um, and there's never enough people to, to support what you need. And so it does become a, a grind. And, you know, it's it's not surprising that, you know, certainly incident responders are uh, are getting burned out. But even with, you know, just sitting in security operations centers and security uh, teams in general, uh, it can be a thankless job sometimes. And when you're always on, you know, you really have to focus on being able to disconnect and, and trusting the rest of your team to say, hey, like, I can fully disconnect. I don't need to be plugged in. Because otherwise, you do hit that burnout very, very quickly. And and then you also were you were fortunate enough to to move to a technology company, right? And you went through an acquisition by another company uh, again, which is very fortunate, I think, that, to, to have that experience because you've seen that um, the whole process of getting acquired by a larger company. Um, talk to me a bit about that. Why why did you decide to, to move to uh, specifically uh, from a services company to a technology company, and then? Um, what was it like to, to be acquired? What was your role there? Yeah, so, you know, I've gone through several acquisitions now, the first with Mandiant and FireEye, and that was that was an interesting journey just going from, uh, you know, a, I say a small company, but there were uh, there was about 500 employees at that time, uh, if not more, uh, and go, getting folded up into FireEye. You know, after, um, you know, after uh, I had gone through, uh, after I'd left IR uh, and I, the first time, <laughs> Uh, and I switched over. I was really just looking for a different type of challenge, right? And so that that role was completely non-technical. I went into business development and partnership uh, mode. And so you know, it was a different type of challenge, still trying to help the, in this case, it was helping forensics teams use the technology. Um, and then after the acquisition, yeah, it was interesting, right? Because a lot of it was, how does how does this small company fit into a much larger one? And so a lot of it was, okay, why were we acquired in the first place? You know, what is that parent organization really trying to accomplish? And understanding that is really important because you have to understand what is it that you're trying to work towards? Because I saw this uh, certainly uh, through that acquisition, certainly through the, uh, the Mandate and Fire I won. If you're not on the same page, you're just working against each other. And I, I truly believe that's why a lot of these acquisitions fail because you, there isn't alignment that's identified where you're working towards that common goal. Uh, a lot of times the the company that's getting acquired just continues what they were trying to do before and they lose sight of what the larger picture is and how you can really uh, draft off of that larger company to get to your goal quicker. Uh, and I think that was one of the, the biggest learnings that I had uh, with the, the, the acquisition by Gigamon was you know, really identifying what's the longer term picture for you? Why did you go after you know, this company and, and buy them? And how does that tie into your overall strategy? And how can we help you accomplish that? Yeah, and uh, you know, there's always this really interesting area where they tell you, okay, no, keep doing what you're doing, you know, and then three months in, and then all of everything changes, and then some of the great people leave, 
you know, and then what happened is they are left with something that is a shell of its former glory. Um, and then the customers are unhappy because they, you know, they've bought one, one thing and then all of a sudden the parent company took over and all the people that they liked and recognized and were help, helping them are now gone. So that they, there's this experience as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's more obvious in a services company when they get acquired, because when the people leave, you know, people are the lifeblood of a services organization, even in tech enabled ones. Uh, and so I think, you know, frankly, I think I underestimated just how important the people were in a product uh, company as well, because you have these internal evangelists that really drive things forward. And when they get disempowered or uh, disenfranchised and just kind of lose that passion, it's infectious. And you, you do find that in product organizations, you know, equally to services, when those those core people leave, uh, it, you just lose your way. Uh, and it, it can become impossible to really move forward unless somebody else is jumping in and, and really taking taking over that that type of uh, that leadership role. And did that make you that experience make you want to create your own company and you kind of you became an entrepreneur as well? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I co-founded a, a company, Mox Five, uh, with actually the former uh, CEO of uh, a previous startup that I, I supported, Cripsis. Uh, and so, yeah, it, that was uh, that was really getting back to my roots of like, how do I solve the problem of these incidents at a larger scale? And so, I think it was always on the back of my mind that I was, that I wanted to get back to that that type of challenge um, and solve these types of problems. But yeah, when especially when you go to these acquisitions, you kind of lose sight of what are we really working towards, right? And, you know, who is it that we're really trying to help? There's something to be said of startups where you're so close to the problem uh, and you can really make some interesting changes as a result. Yeah, and, and uh, startups are kind of the leading edge because they have to be. They, You know, it's a part of it being a capitalist society. In order for them to survive, they have to do something innovative that no one else does, or at least better than a little bit better, even incrementally better than anybody else. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that's how progress happens, right? You know, you, you don't necessarily need to build the next Google, uh, Google to, to drive change, but you got to find better ways of doing it to, to be heard, right? Cause you are a, a very small insect in a very large world when you're a startup. <laughs> yes, I like that. Um, Jason, I'll, and I'll attribute that next time I use that term. <laughs> uh, you know, you got the trademark on it. So, so from there onwards, you took ownership of a, like a, a bigger role, right? So, you know, how was that? Did you know that was, again, did you make a decision, a, con a conscious decision to take ownership over a, to be an executive? Um, you know, basically the, almost kind of the top, uh, top role in this, in this, uh, you know, cybersecurity industry is uh, becoming a CISO. Yeah, you know, when when I started on the, the CISO path, and, and frankly, like I never thought that I would want to be a, a CISO. Uh, and you know, there's, I don't know if I would even say that uh, it, it's something that I aspired to. Right? Uh, it's the top role in security, and it's a fundamentally important one. And I think you know what I when I was looking at the next role, and you know, I was looking at let me let me try my hand at a, a CISO role. Um, I, I, I knew that I needed a broader exposure, right? Because just my experience in startups and my interest in solving problems, I knew that if I was just focused on the internal side only, uh, it probably wouldn't pan out for me. And so when I was looking to make this, this switch, I was specifically looking for roles that had a joint approach of internal security and something else, something customer facing where I could still stay close to other problems. And uh, you know, this goes back to like, what, what's the problem where I'm really looking to solve, right? Of, of these cybersecurity incidents, right? And so we're specifically looking at cyber insurance, they're uniquely positioned to drive change, right? And so as I'm going through all these different incidents and I'm seeing, man, if they had MFA in place, if they, if they didn't have RDP exposed to the internet, I wouldn't be here, right? And so insurance is uniquely positioned to mandate these things. And so that's where, you know, I was instantly gravitated towards these uh, cyber insurance carriers where one, I could dip my toe into the CISO role and see, you know, what does this look like, right? And how can I secure an organization internally? Because I've always seen it from a, a consultant's point of view, where it's just like, hey, go do these recommendations and you'll be more secure. But I didn't have the experience in actually implementing those. And so I wanted to get exposure to that. And in tandem, still scratch that itch of how do I solve cybersecurity at scale? 
And and it's amazing because it's a perfect role because your goals as as a insurance company are aligned with the customers. You know, the customers doesn't want to pay high premiums. They don't want to get hacked. And you want to keep them as a customer uh, forever. And so you have that. So so now you're in a unique role to, to talk to a lot of customers and, and have a much greater impact. Um, and, and so how was your first, you know, do you remember like the first six months? Like, you know, what was it kind of like landing in a brand new role? And listen, you, you have the chops to prove it because you've done so much. Um, and I'm sure that's why you got that role is just because they looked at you and said, okay, yeah, you know, I definitely want that guy because he's done all, you know, A, B, C, and D and it was successful at all of them. Uh, so do you remember like the first six months? What was, uh, was it like for you? Yeah, it was an interesting transition, right? You know, and I think for me personally, it was, an interesting transition because it was the first time that I was really in industry, right? You know, uh, being born and raised in incident response and, you know, living the, the lifeline of a, a consultant, switching over to industry was a, a really interesting challenge. Uh, and so, you know, frankly, I think I overestimated just the amount of effort that it takes to implement change within an organization. There's a lot of influence that has to happen. Uh, a lot of marketing, a lot of internal marketing to make sure that you, you've got the alignment internally and have everybody on the same page uh, so that you can move your initiatives forward, right? You know, Jason, I think after this statement, we have to pause at least for like 10, 15 seconds to let people sink in because it's very <laughs> profound. You know, we can be, you know, it, it, you, it's, a, it's like an understatement right there. Like there's so much resistance to change in an organization uh, for anything, not just for cybersecurity. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it, it has to be intentional as well. Right. And I think this is the, the critical learning for me was I was very used to, as a consultant, you come in and it's somebody that's paying you for your opinion. Right. So they're going to listen. And so when you put together these recommendations, they're not going to do all of them but you can see the instant change that's going to happen. And that's just not the reality when you're in industry. And it, it shouldn't be, right? Because you have to be more fiscally responsible. You have to leverage other teams to accomplish what you're working on. And so there's much more time on being thoughtful of how do we prioritize the things that really matter, right? And I, I thankfully for me, having done IR, that was a much easier thing for me to understand because I, I just intrinsically knew well, if we focus our efforts on these, you know, three areas, we're going to get a much better return on investment of time and resources, right? So you have to live, eat, and breathe the Pareto principle of, uh, you know, 20% of your efforts should give you 80% of your returns, right? That is something that is really intrinsically important so that you can focus your efforts down because you can't boil the ocean as an internal system. You have to understand what are the real risks how do you address those and how do you gain alignment to achieve the goals that you're looking to achieve? And also, I don't know if you're fortunate or unfortunate, but when you landed this role, things have really kind of changed in the cybersecurity industry as well. Uh, you know, we, we got hit with the pandemic. So the, uh, you know, ransomware was through the roof. Um, there were some monumental cases. So for example, Merck, uh, you know, come to mind. Um, so the, the cyber insurance industry is also changing, even though despite the fact that insurance is uh, fundamentally, you know, a slower, slower pace, but it's, it's really changed. So we've seen that hands on. Talk to me a bit about that. Like, you know, again, you have the unique proposition to see this uh, from a practitioner, but also somebody who sits in your position. So talk to me about what changed in the past, you know, 10, 12, 18 months in, in cyber insurance space. So... Uh, the, the amount of pain, I think, is the is the the direct answer there. Right? You know, ransomware has really driven a lot of change in the industry, and a lot of carriers struggle to to keep up with that. You know, you, you deal from when I started really digging into ransomware is 2016, and I was dealing with the Sam Sam ransomware group, which was the first group that did what I would call enterprise ransomware, where it wasn't focused on a single system. It was focused on deploying ransomware out to an entire enterprise. And at that time, the ransoms were, you know, 15K. When we saw a 50K ransom, we we're like, whoa, that's crazy, right? Um, <laughs> but that just completely spiked. Those are the good days. It, it, yeah, exactly. It's, we're vying for when uh, the ransoms were lower, right? Um, but yeah, as these other groups caught on and, you know, as the ransomware as a service models came in, you have the affiliate models, you have just specialization. It drove efficiencies in, in for, uh, for attackers. And so you had a spike in frequency of these attacks and you had a spike in severity with these, these ransom payments. 
Uh, and so I think that was where a lot of the learnings were coming to play is what types of controls should we be trying to mandate? And so you saw a pretty rapid shift, rapid uh, for cyber insurance uh, or the insurance market in general, where it wasn't just a, a questionnaire that had maybe five to 10 questions. It was a much more granular process with longer questions with scanning technology coming into play to really try to assess what is the true risk of an environment and is that something that the insurance carrier wants to take on? And so that's why we're starting to see mandates for certain controls like MFA, uh, you know, controls like EDR being placed on, on systems. These are all positive things because the carriers are paying attention and seeing where are the weak spots and what are the controls that could be in place that can help reduce these costs. And that's why, to your point before of insurance carriers being aligned with uh, companies, I think that's an often uh, overlooked viewpoint, right? There is probably nobody else that is more closely aligned from a financial incentive to keep you safe and secure. And there's few companies that have the insights and visibility that carriers do to the claims. And so when you marry that together, you will really see that these, these insurance carriers are a partner for you. And so you should be able to use them in that capacity. Well, I, I think people just, you know, they, they complain about the premiums, right? And, and they always see like the fact that they pay the premium and if they don't use it, they say, oh, it's a sunk cost. But it's not really sunk cost. It's it's just it's part of doing business. And uh, and and you, you're right. There's there's alignment there. Um, you know, especially when again, it's a win-win situation. Even if you pay the premium and nothing happens, it's still better for you than than you know getting a premium increase or or getting losses associated with. It. Because even even if people don't realize, even if you get hit and you get covered by the insurance companies, it's still the damage is is still done. You know, a lot of companies, you may get the, the you know, they may cover the cost associated with that particular ransomware or not, but it, can be, it still may go out of business within, you know, six to 12 months, despite the fact that you received money from the insurance company. Um, so it doesn't cover you there. Exactly, yeah. And you know, when you look at insurance, it's, it's risk, you're, you're just transferring the risk, right? And so I can have the option to ignore the risk where just do nothing, you know, don't improve my security, don't get insurance. I can transfer that to the insurance carrier with the cost uh, or I can accept it, right, myself and just deal with it uh, and kind of figure out what happens. And so I think when a lot of people look at this risk transference, they just look at it as I'm just transferring the financial cost. And yeah, that's it's really a, a short-sighted way to look at it, right? Because yes, you will transfer the potential cost of a catastrophic event, you know, like a ransomware incident, but there's so much more that has to happen because if you get that, to your point, I mean, we're seeing more and more companies now that will struggle financially afterwards, especially in the SMB space where you know, maybe they didn't buy enough uh, cyber insurance to cover the cost. Uh, maybe they decide that, uh, you know what, we're not gonna pay the ransom or maybe their backups are completely toast and they have to completely rebuild. You know, these are things that the longer you're out, the more impact it's going to have on your customers. And there's no insurance policy in the world that's going to just support you all the way through to you know, g give you additional funding to keep your business afloat. Insurance will help you get through the event, but there's a long tail of things post-incident that can happen that are outside anyone's control. And so that's where, yeah, it, even with insurance, it still behooves you to put the time and energy and resources up front to try to prevent this from happening. And, you know, this is where insurance carriers can help with that as well. You know, how many of us, like, I, I'm guilty of this with my car insurance. I know they offer me a lot of free things, but I, you know, am I logging into the site to look at that? No. Uh, and that's on me, right? But like, Cyber insurance carriers go out of their way to provide discounts for services, uh, free services, information, right? And so that's where I think we all have to do a better job, uh, not only on our personal insurance uh, items, right, but with cyber insurance as well. And predominantly, what's available to me as a company that will help me mitigate my risk? And how can you make yourself more um, you know, insurance ready. So for example, you know, if we, if we take an analogy of, you know, like uh, life insurance, so you can have a, like a healthy lifestyle, right? So you can be, you know, pro proper weight, uh, you know, exercise and have all the, you know, the biomarks, you know, ready to go. So your life insurance premium is fairly low, you know, so because, you know, if you don't, if you smoke, if you you're overweight and you have all kinds of medical conditions that are underlying conditions, you pay more for life insurance. Same, we can apply that principle to, to companies, right, with cyber insurance. If they, you know, potentially have a, 
you know, risk management associated with their organization in such a way. So maybe tell me about what can they do to become, you know, what I always say, let me rephrase this question. What are the kind of the top five things that the insurance carrier looks at and say, okay, these guys, you know, they'll get the lowest premium because they're, they're, you know, they're okay. So I, I think an even larger challenge for companies right now is whether they can get a policy period. Right. And so it, a right. lot of it comes back to what are the fundamental controls that you have in your organization? Right. And so when you're looking at that, the top things that may, most carriers are looking for today are technologies like MFA. Do you have MFA for email? Do you have MFA for remote access? It sounds almost basic. Right? It's, it's, and it's not like a complicated uh, endeavor. It's you not. Know, right. And it's, the, it's the classic challenge with cybersecurity is it seems like a very complex thing. And it is. But you don't have to look at it as if it's this different language, right? If you focus on the basics, you're already 80% ahead of most other people, right? And so it's, it's MFA, it's EDR, it's uh, email security, right? It's all the things that support business email compromise or, or help prevent business email compromise, unauthorized access to your email accounts uh, and ransomware, right? And so if you can focus on some of these fundamentals, you're going to just shine or outshine so many other people because, again, people just tend to forget about those basic things and want to go for you know, the shiny Ferrari versus the, the blocking and tackling of the security world. And if you get rejected, right, which you mentioned it's happens quite a bit, right? you go to the insurance company and say, hey, can you insure me? And they come back and say, nope. We don't want you as a client, which is really unfortunate. Is there something they can do? Is, a, is there an appeal process? We say, hey, you know, uh, we will come back in, in 30 days, 60 days, and now we've we've fixed these things and we're better off. Can, can they do that? Uh, you know, it's always situational dependent. Uh, you know, this is something where if there are fundamental controls, you, know, you can get those in place and then uh, resubmit that application for it. Uh, there are other things where, um, you know, there might be coverage that's going to be provided based on you signing off that, yes, we're going to go and deploy MFA in the next 30 days. So it really depends on the carrier. I think a lot of times what ends up happening is that when you're working with your insurance broker, they're looking to try to get you the best deal possible. And so they're going to fish out your application to as many markets as they can uh, to try to identify what's the best fit for you. Um, and in those situations, you're typically going to get the same answers. So kind of all roads lead back to make sure these controls are in place and then we'll be ready to have that conversation. And so for companies that are first starting out looking at cyber insurance, you know, you're, you're typically going to be a smaller company and you can usually uh, find something uh, fairly straightforward with some decent coverage. When you start getting larger and you're able to secure your first policy, the next game becomes how do we stay on that policy? And so that's where having the conversations six months before your renewal with your broker, hey, what do we need to be thinking about? Um, that becomes really important because you don't want a surprise with 30 days left that, you know, the insurance carrier is now mandating a new control and you have to struggle to figure out how do you get this deployed in the next 30 days? Um, or, you know, how can you extend your policy for 60, 90 days so that you can get these other controls in place? And it's really interesting, Jason, because it's moving much quicker. It doesn't necessarily happen in a, let's say in the real estate business, you most likely will be able to renew the policy because, you know, things are pretty stagnant. I mean, unless you added an addition to your house or put it in a fireplace. But in the, in our business, things are moving rapidly and whatever controls were okay, like, you know, six months ago may not be okay now, right? Yeah, it's the property is a good example where it's it's fairly predictable, right? We We have a sense, even with all of the crazy stuff that's happening with weather now, of what potentially could happen. And you can model out your catastrophes fairly easily, right? Uh, we know that in property that you're not, an insurance carrier is not going to put all of their, their policies in Florida, right? That would be a very bad thing. The challenge with cybersecurity is that there's not a lot of predictability in what can happen, right? You know, the, the next log for J, if it, if it actually got to the point where that was weaponized efficiently, you know, it's difficult to predict the losses on scenarios like that. Um, you know, it's not like you know, property doesn't have to deal with Godzilla coming out of the ocean uh, sporadically <laughs> from time to well, time. Well, not yet, Jason. Yeah, not yet, you right? Know. But, you know, with, with cyber, it's those sort of things happen because it's just you're always just one attack away from a, a catastrophic event. Uh, and it's really difficult to, per, to predict what that could be. 
Yeah, there's no actuary uh, tables for some of these events that are. I think that's the problem. We can predict, uh, you know, when you can walk over a, a gutter in New York City and fall through, there's some numbers associated with it. But for, for cyber, as you mentioned, there's in particular, there's events that are very much unforeseen and have a great impact, you know, solar winds and so on. Exactly. And, and and we're still young as a cybersecurity market, right? Even just the, as a, as a an entire security technology community, right? We're, we're still relatively young in the grand scheme of, uh, of insurance. So it's very much so still trying to collect all the right sets of information and see how, how can we predict that? And, you know, these, the smaller insure techs are better suited uh, in position for that because they have a more tech driven approach uh, than some of the traditional carriers but there's still only so much data that you can collect that can help build some of these these tables out. What about the language being used in the contract? Can you can you comment on that? There's, there's some, you know, folks that had uh, had made comments online about uh, you know making sure that the language is there because again, it's those nuances. You know, if there's certain you know, exclusions, just like, a, again, just like real estate, right? If you have a fireplace that just hasn't been inspected, you know, in the past, uh, you know, the past year and your house burns down, maybe that's, that's an exclusion. In cyber, it's more complicated than that. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I think this really comes down to just understanding what's covered and what isn't, you know, uh, we've, I've seen this um, quite often where there are assumptions made on what's covered and, uh, and misunderstandings, right? And so it's like with anything else, you really have to understand what it is you're buying. And, you know, language is changing, uh, circumstances are changing. And so, you know, as a, as a consumer, um, it, it really is in your best interest to ask those questions ahead of time, work with your broker to understand what, what's included and what's not. Uh, you know, with my time doing uh, business recovery, for, uh, for Mox 5, what I found all too often was everyone, uh, not everyone, but a, a lot of uh, policyholders thought, hey, uh, we can just rebuild our entire environment and buy all new hardware. Uh, and then you learn the hard way that, hey, uh, not all that stuff is covered, right? You know, when you get into a car accident and you're driving a, a Ford Focus, you're, you're not going to get a Ferrari in return, right? Uh, or... You're not going to get a brand, but sometimes you don't get a brand new Ford Focus. You get a, a used one, the same value. It's exactly. Like a, it's, it's, you know. Exactly. And, and so that's, those are the types of things, like, it's just understanding ahead of time so that you're not caught by surprise. And I'm sure the same thing happens in, in auto where you're just like, oh, I thought I was going to get a brand new car. What the heck? But it's like, no, no, the insurance exists to get you back to where you were before, not to get you, you know, 15, 25 steps ahead. And can you segment the policy, for example, to only protect my crown jewels of the company to reduce the costs associated with, with the with the premium, or is it not something? And again, I'm I'm just asking as kind of a layman terms, uh, in terms of the the kind of the insurance coverage. Uh, I haven't seen anything like that. Typically, it's going to be based for the the organizational level, right? So you'll you'll get into nuances where if there's a sister organization or shared environments and things of that nature, uh, and typically it's just going to cover whatever assets are owned by that organization. I, I haven't seen anything close to uh, that micro segmentation. <laughs> And and what about uh, your third party, right? Would you have to potentially look at the exposure there? Uh, can you force because the third party is a risk to your organization? Can you force them to have certain measures and maybe have uh, cyber insurance on on your third party as well? Yeah, I think that's part of a, an effective third party risk management program. Right? You know, you're you're looking at what damage could they possibly do to you based on their access, based on the data they have. Uh, and if you're not asking about their insurance requirements, you, you certainly should, right? Because at the end of the day, if uh, an issue is their fault, you know, they, they potentially are going to be liable. Uh, and you don't want to be stuck holding the bag at the end of the day for that, uh, for something that you had really no control over outside of just trying to make the right bet on which vendor you want to use. And do the insurance company as a whole monitors um, so, you know, like, for example, you're talking about Florida. So all of a sudden you see like certain weather patterns, right? So you say, cause insurance companies are there to make money and they're not, you know, they're, they're dot com, not dot org. They're not there to service you for pro bono. So there's going to be a time where they have to monitor what's happening. So for example, the kinetic, uh, uh, conflict between Ukraine and Russia creates a certain environment and so on. So do, do insurance company monitor kind of what's happening on the outside world to, 
to figure things out, like how the premium is going to look like for, for the next, you know, 12, 18 months? Yeah, all of these things factor into how uh, an insurance carrier assesses risk. You know, when, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a pretty consistent response uh, across the insurance industry of, of looking closely at, hey, what, uh, what policyholders have systems located in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus? Because you could have another MERS situation where there's uh, some destructive malware that can auto-propagate and you know, we're dealing with a, a crazy loss uh, that's impacting global organizations. So you know, early on, um, it's really about trying to support policyholders, give them the information they need to protect themselves while in tandem assessing the potential risk of uh, if in a, a, an attack does happen and you know something does get out. So carriers are definitely looking at that global level. Uh, you know, I think where it's going to vary is how do they put that into action? And that's going to vary based on you know, carrier to carrier. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what about, you know, like the, and this is great, a, a great conversation. I think it's uh, very insightful for somebody like yourself who is uh, responding to this. Um, so it, Talk, talking about uh, car insurance, for example, so they, uh, I think that somebody who drives a red car, for example, has potentially a slightly elevated premium because, the, you know, I guess they did some some statistics that whoever drives a red car is more prone to, to get into car accidents. It may be just, and if you apply that to cyber insurance, are they companies that are notoriously more at risk, maybe because they're more hated, like they're not, you know, they're more groups that want to attack them or potentially are, uh, you know, have some risky business and so on. So they're like, you know, have an elevated uh, um, risk associated with them. Yeah. Like a red car. Yeah. Th there's a few different things there, right? You know, you can look at an industry level uh, based on the impact of, uh, of a cyber incident, right? Manufacturing organizations, they, they tend to get hit a lot and they tend to have a lot of business interruption because when their manufacturing devices uh, and systems go down, they stop, right? And so there's some inherent risk on the severity side of these incidents having a larger blast radius and potentially more cost. So you know, that's one aspect of it. When you look at it with a lot of the insure techs will leverage some sort of scan technology, right? And so this is where you can you can sort of get into the, the red car analogy that you're saying, uh, where it's about trying to predict the likelihood of an incident. And so it becomes more of a data science problem than anything else. And so there are tons and tons of analytics that are going into trying to identify that, that red car phenomenon. Uh, but you know, you can go even more basic just from the applications themselves, right? Uh, we know uh, intrinsically, and I think every security professional knows this intrinsically, if you don't have MFA on your email, you are more likely to have a business email compromise. Uh, and you can take a data approach to these things as well. You know, we, we see that organizations that don't invest in security email gateways or you know, similar technologies are twice as likely to have a business email compromise than somebody that doesn't. So there are things like that where it's just it's intrinsic knowledge from security professionals. And it's the basic, most obvious things that can really just help say, are you going to be more likely to have an incident than somebody else? And does the insurance company, do they send out, so for example, if you're coming back to the, to the real estate, so you, uh, you apply for, for insurance and then sometimes if somebody comes over and make the assessment, they take some photos, they write some notes and they, they try to match what your claims were with, you know, with what you actually see. Is that happening as well in the cyberspace? So there's a few areas where it does. You know, the scanning technology is really that starting point. You know, if you look at the property side, you know, you might have somebody coming out who's looking at the number of sprinklers that are in a, a building, right? So it's a very similar idea with um, with these scan uh, technologies. Try to essentially map your external infrastructure, and it's, it's not perfect. And do you use that? Uh, do you use that like automated scanning or using this uh, with conjunction to like open source intelligence? How does that work? Uh, it really depends on the insurance carrier and how they they try to approach that. But in its basic element, it's it's very similar to an attack surface management tool where it's going to map your infrastructure, try to identify vulnerabilities. Uh, and make assumptions on you know what that risk is overall. And again, it's not perfect, right? It's not going behind the firewall and looking at configurations. But you know, this is a it's a balance between how can we collect as much information as possible 
without being overly intrusive and hurting uh, your ability to, to, to get a policy, right? And so you have to balance this out. After somebody becomes a policyholder, you, know, you can get some additional information you know, and try to collect more insights into what they're doing. And then certainly after somebody has a claim, you know, there's going to be uh, some looking at the different costs and things of that nature. But it's relatively rare to have, you know, a human going out to a, a location to uh, to assess the damage or anything like that. It's it, it's happened before, um, but it's not a, a common occurrence. And what about having, uh, you know, a certain individual on staff? So, for example, listen, I. If I knew that, Jason, that you were heading my security, I would just say, well, you know, this guy knows what he's doing, so I'll give them a lower premium because look, look at him. He's got this, you know, this chops to prove it. Do you do that as well for, you know, for, you know, like just saying, okay, look at his staff. They're, they are, you know, very proficient. They have a, a track record. It's almost like being a soccer player. You kind of figure out like a, the group has, has certain certain soccer players that you know they're going to be more successful can you apply that to cybersecurity insurance as well? I, I think in the future, that's certainly a possibility, right? You know, the, the challenge today is how do you get that information? Uh, you know, it's unfortunately we don't live in a world right now where, you know, the SOC managers have uh, basically a, the equivalent of a Pokemon card with their stats and, and how they're doing, right? Uh, you know, that's something I think in the future, if, if you can collect that information in a systematic way, uh, I think that makes a difference because, you know, I don't, I think there's there's something to be said of having the right security leadership in place and knowing that it's somebody that's going to prioritize things effectively and and have accountability, right? You know, it's this is could be the simple difference of somebody having a CISO versus somebody not, right? It's are you investing in the right areas and are you going down the right path of security? Maybe they'll have a little monitor, you know, like the the uh, the, insur the car insurance companies offer you know, to see how you drive, yeah. you know, and a lot of people opt out of that, but, you know, they can tell. So maybe there's something like that for, you know, maybe attached to the CISO virtually and say, okay, you know, are they doing a great job or, you know, what is the stats on the organization over a period of time? And I, I think that's where the industry has to go is how do you better measure the maturity and the efficacy of a security program? Uh, those are the things that you need that internal visibility and, and a, a way to be able to collect that data. And you also have to have it where, the people who are applying for uh, cyber insurance are willing to share that because, you know, if, if you build these systems and nobody wants to sign up for it, then you know, you're, you're right back where you started. Exactly. And um, this is, I think this goes back to what we were talking about before with, uh, you know, if, if you can provide the right sets of information, right. And you can allow people to work together and solve the problem, right. It's, it's not just, hey, you know, company A, you're going to solve cybersecurity for the world. That's just not going to happen, right? So if we can all work together and share information and have that common interest in place, you know, that's where we're going to be better positioned to identify the trends and really pull out information and, and figure out, like, what are the root causes? What are the real things that are contributing to the severity and frequency of these attacks? And how can we start putting the proper defenses in places across the globe, right? Not just company A or company B, you know, let's look at an entire industry. Let's look at an entire country. Let's look at the entire world. Let's, let's try to solve this at a larger level because solving it at the individual, you know, company level, you're going to be playing uh, whack-a-mole forever. Yeah. And, and I feel like we have to do this. Um, it's a matter of national security. So it's all our best interest to, to do that information sharing because the adversaries are doing that. Absolutely. You know, just to, to better themselves. Yeah, Colonial Pipeline yeah. was the wake up call for the U.S. It's you know, these these ransomware attacks don't just affect digital assets. You know, it's you had an entire the entire East Coast scrambling to try to get gas because of uncertainty. It's that's a very tangible result of uh, of a ransomware incident. And, you know, a lot of these attacks are not far off from that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jason, it's been an amazing conversation. I'll ask you one more question. And you did a phenomenal job. This was completely unscripted, so we did not plan any of these questions. Um, yeah, it was totally amazing. So I'll tell you what my top concern is, and I don't think we're well positioned uh, to, to tackle this today with the existing tool sets. We, we see with ransomware the shift towards data theft, um, either coupled with the encryption of systems or now, you know, thanks to Lapsus Group and a few other groups now where there's just straight up data theft. And so the identification of data in your environment and understanding who has access to it and putting controls in place, there's no perfect system in place now. You, you know, you're touching on some access controls, IAM, you're touching on some DLP type things. Uh, 
that to me is is uncharted territory right now. And if we do see more attackers shifting there, uh, I think most companies aren't well positioned to try to prevent those types of attacks today. And and we're you know knowledge based economy. Data is everything. What's the easiest uh, way for people to reach out to you and maybe learn some more or just uh, advice or whatnot? What's the easiest way? Uh, so I'm, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. So I'd say if, uh, if you have questions or want to interact, uh, hit me up on, on LinkedIn um, and, you know, keep the conversation going there. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jason, for joining us today. Much, much appreciated.